Excited to welcome Francesco Nanni to the Basketball Podcast. Francesco Nanni is an Italian professional coach who's coached for over 10 years at various levels within Italy from mini basket to pro. Nanni currently coaches at Scafetti Basket, one of the top teams in the Italian A2 League. Nanny has worked with some of the top prospects at the youth level in Italy, as well as being well regarded for the quality of his content sharing on various social media platforms. Francesco Nanny has developed a unique methodology for improving the offensive one on one skills of players from youth to pro. Now you can learn from Coach Nanny at immersionvideos.com or Francesco Nanny Basketball.com from his six part video series, Developing One on One Skills with Francesco Nanny. Check out this video series at immersionvideos.com. Francesco Nanny Basketball.com. That's F R A N C E S C O N A N N I Basketball.com. Francesco Nanny Basketball.com. Coach Nanny, welcome to the podcast. Welcome, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a huge listener of the podcast, and it's really an honor to be here. Well, it's been wonderful to get to know you. We've developed an online relationship. And uh, isn't that part of the blessing of all this that, uh, you know, through all your sharing and all your interactions online, you've developed an online following and uh, online friendships as well, eh? Yeah, it's it's really huge what's been happening all around the world, especially during COVID. It was such a huge source of interest, of knowledge, of connecting, of getting to know better people. And it was a pleasure to meet everybody on. Uh, like life face to face after the pandemic. Well, so fun. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk a lot about uh, European basketball and just in general, but uh, let's start with uh, developing one on one skills with Francesco Nanny, uh, the video series you did for Immersion Videos. And, uh, you know, really cool stuff because, and for coaches that uh, check it out, I mean, you'll see some unique things. But let's start from the foundation. Why one on one is so important to you as a coach? I think that one-on-one is, is very important for many reasons. If we speak about young kids, one-on-one is why they enter in the gym. One-on-one is why they can become more confident in their skill and is the foundation of the game. Uh, I hear so many coaches uh, obsess and for some right reason at the young level, like, oh, my under-15 teams passes the ball a lot. We score only assisted basket. We practice every time without dribbling the ball. And... While I can understand it, and I was like that like 10 years ago, uh, eight years ago, now I think that people need to be able to develop one-on-one skills and that our goal, especially at the younger level, should not to have like the team that play the cutest, let's say, basketball or like the San Antonio Spurs beautiful game, but we need to develop players who are able to problem solve on the fly. And obviously, like passing the ball is a component of that, but to be able to create an advantage for yourself or to maintain an advantage that somebody else has, has built with quick decision, we include like the use of dribble, attacking close out is crucial. It is crucial. And, uh, you know, you demonstrate throughout the video this and uh, least people don't think passing is a part of it, but passing is a part. And there's a whole video on one on one passing and talking about developing yeah. passing within one on one context. Can you talk about that and explain that well, how that fits in? Yeah, I think that. You know, passing is one of the natural conclusion of one-on-one because if we think at any decent level, your one-on-one is rarely going to finish at the rim, especially in European basketball. I know that the spacing is different in the, uh, like, high school basketball. I've seen some AAU games live. Most of the times, I would say, when you're able to beat your man one-on-one, you have a chance to finish, maybe not with a layup, but with, like, a contested finishing at the rim. In Europe, the space is, is much more crowded, and so... To be able to pass on the move is one of the crucial skills that you need to have. And then we get to one of the main points that is that one one is also without the ball. Because we see too many times that players start to play one on one only when they have the ball. While I was speaking the other day with somebody that has done your podcast, Ross McNeese, another great player development coach and just a coach in general. And we were speaking about pre catch decision. So, how many times you see uh, what we call like a, a roadrunner catch, a stampede catch, where you're able to make a decision while the ball is flying to you and you're actually starting to move before you catch the ball. And this is crucial, especially for maybe less athletic player where you don't have the burst, the first step of a James Sarden, of a Kyrie Irving. You need to be able to build as much advantage as possible before the catch. Yeah, and it, it connects with perception and decision prior to skill execution and this concept of 
basically, if you're making the decision after you've already caught the ball, then it's too late in the modern game, isn't it? Absolutely. Again, you lose the advantage. This is something that this terminology, you know, is crucial for Italian coaches. You've had Messina on your podcast. You have listened to many Italian coaches speak. We always speak about creating an advantage, maintain it, and like finalize it, like simply score a basket. And what I think is crucial is that we see a lot of time at any level, like even the highest level, players will get the ball and there is a close-up happening and they stop the ball and then maybe play a jab step or they do something in a static way. While if you're able to attack that closeout, and it doesn't mean attack by driving, by making the next pass you can do, you can make a shot fake to make the defender come even closer to you, but you need to do something with that space that you've created as an advantage, because if you simply stop and wait, then it's harder. Like maybe you're going to be able to score in the end, but you create a harder, harder situation for yourself. Yeah, it's great stuff. And uh, it's it's not the one on one of the olden days, right, where we're playing check, check the ball and play one on one. Right. Yeah. So explain yeah. to coaches, because I know they've heard it from us and from you a lot. What is a dynamic start and why are dynamic starts so important to developing one on one skills? So I think there are two reasons. The first reason, let's say the more strategic reason is that we want to have as much dynamic start as possible in the game. We want to catch the ball on the move. It's easier to score. It's easier to generate an advantage. But I think there is a second reason that is crucial for the young players and that it's, it makes it so much easier for even like under 12 players, under 13 players to have success and to have fun when they practice. Because if you make an under 13 player play a study one-on-one, okay, check the ball and then we score, they're never going to score maybe. They're going to be, the rate of success is going to be probably like 20, 30%. It depends on the level, obviously. But if we're speaking about same level players, they're not going to be able to score. They're going to see many dribbles, many useless dribbles. While if you play in a dynamic start, everybody can feel more confident. Everybody can really uh, put the skills that they don't need to use in the game at a test. And it's also more fun, you know, in... You're, you're a master in this, but uh, you cannot keep the attention of the kids if you do something incredibly harder for two hours. So if you start a little bit lower and you don't need to move in a linear progression, but you let them experiment with different dynamics, start with different type of advantages. Maybe sometimes it's a spatial, a spatial advantage of any kind. Sometimes the defender is closer, but maybe it's, it's gonna start like on your hip. Maybe the defender is coming from being turn around is going to like turn around and come at you. Like you can manipulate the constraint as, as you always said to create different time, different uh, experiences for the players. Well, and it's not just an offensive experience. It's a defensive experience as well, isn't it? And that's, what's really valuable about one-on-one is that there's two way teaching opportunities and two way learning opportunities. And you can give the advantage to the defense as much as you can give it to the offense to shape learning. Can you talk about the defensive component of one-on-one and the value of that? Yeah, I think uh, so. The first time you introduce guided defense, especially for a group of kids that maybe have never been coached in this game-based approach, let's say, is that you spend most of the time correcting the defense. You, it, it seemed a little bit slower in the beginning because maybe you don't focus on the offense because the defense maybe do those type of old school guided defense where, okay, I have to shade you to the left and I put my body completely on your right shoulder. And that's as it's better than being on air, but it's still not a real decision. It's not a real perception that you will have in the game. Well, I want my guided defense to be as similar as possible to what your eyes are going to see in the game, to what is going to really happening in the game. And so this also teaches my defender, okay, so this is what I have to do if I want to send somebody to the left hand. This is what I have to do if I want to send somebody to the left hand, but maybe immediately cut him off on the first dribble, maybe swipe for the ball to try to get a steal. And uh after you do this in the first couple of practices, after the kids really understand what you want from them, then every guided defense drill at the exercise, most of the games is going to come so much better. I was using guided defense with like under eight player, like simply doing a layup with somebody on your side, with somebody touching your shoulder, and you can really raise the level of the task really, really slowly. And one of the fun part of doing this is that as for the experience of many coaches, 
you don't have 12 players at the same level. You have players which pretty great players for your level, then average, then maybe two or three bad players. And by doing guided defense, you can put them together. Obviously, sometimes they're going to try to mix them up to create new connection, but you can, at the same time, at different level for the same small set of games because the level of the drill is going to be determined by the level of your competition. So, and I would take it a step even farther than that, and I know you agree with this. It's useless to do an on-air layup. A one-on-0 layup is basically useless. And the main reason is not the biomechanical skill, it's the perception. Before I even look at the target to shoot the layup, I first have to perceive where my defender is, where other defenders are. And that perception process gets completely removed if we do the on-air layup, doesn't it? I agree completely. Like, uh, I think that for every, like, and I'm a huge fan, a huge teacher of mini basketball also. Even the youngest kid had to do everything with perception and action. It, maybe it cannot be, it should not be always like a defender, but it can be other teammates moving around trying to score a layup. And you had to find your window to go and score a layup around them if you don't want to put the defender too early. Maybe is you are dribbling around instead of doing like stationary ball handling and you have to escape from somebody like any variation of tag. Maybe you have to do anything that you do. It can be dribbling, passing, shooting, uh, it can have a perception action coupling because that is really like the amount of time that we can spend more on task doing that. It's, it's huge. It's huge. And uh, you know, at, at all levels of basketball. So take, take us to the next level then um, of layering a one-on-one with constraints or differential learning uh, because you use this for professional players too. This is not just mini basket. So talk to us about yeah. some of the loads and some of the constraints that you can put on to make it uh, again, more realistic, uh, better for uh, transfer to the game. So first of all, uh, when we put it with professional player, we try to use as much uh, real situation of our game as possible. So it's not going to be, okay, you are on the wing and the defender is over here. We want to help them create in their mind the situation that's going to happen in the game. And I know that NBA staff has... Can, can I stop you right there? Just what you just yeah. said. Because uh, I can tell you this also, the tradition of playing one-on-one off the dead top, and you already said the wing. How many times do we play uh, one-on-one in a place where a player doesn't actually ever catch the ball or play from? Yeah. <laughs> so and I love one, one other thing is that yeah. I get so angry with myself sometimes. We spend so few time to teaching what happened in the corners and it's so crucial like you see player stepping out with a foot you see players missing layup because they're not used to make layup from that angle uh, how can they use your their body when they drive baseline to use their body to create space to go to the middle like these are little things that i practice in the corners a lot my players know it it's crazy that's great sorry continue on no it's good uh, so we try to help our players to see, okay, so the ball is going away in the pick and roll. So we have to imagine your defender moving here. And so if the defender is tagging in a little bit lower below you, you can have like a road runner catch. If the defender is going up, you maybe have the space to back cut, but you're gonna be able to receive the pass standing here. You don't like, we try to create a scenario in his mind and then we play from there. And it can be like a spot up situation, but we also play a lot of situational one-on-one. So basically it's gonna be coming up from the corner, playing an end off. We play a lot of like 2v1 situation. For example, one of the drills that I use the most is uh, 2v1 where you have a screener and you have the ball handler. The screener has to be set. So you have to create separation and try to get to the, to the ball screen. And that's already a huge goal for ball handling. You see it's not static. You have somebody that's really pressing on you. And the constraint that we add usually and then obviously can change is that if you reject, you are free to go at the rim. We want to emphasize the reject. If you go over the screen and the defender goes over the screen, you cannot go at the rim. We imagine that it's going to be some sort of like drop coverage of body in front of you. So you can either try to have the space to create a pull-up jumper. You can snake. You can keep on the back and create separation with a side dribble. And if the defense goes under one time, you have only one chance to play a re screen. And it's the same read. You can reject after the under. You can go. The defense goes over. You have the same option as before. And what you see is that you can develop how to use the dribble. You can develop how to create separation for the pull-up jumper. And obviously, you don't practice everything in this drill. You don't passing the you don't practice the passing component of the pick and roll. That's gonna come after. But I think that 
isolate one-on-one -on -one in situations that are going to be useful for the players, like end off. Okay, it's the same, but now we have less dribble because it's going to be more realistic in the game. And when I say less dribble is not the usual, like, okay, you only have two dribbles to play now, but it's more a constraint on the, on the time that they're going to be able to spend in the action. And as you do, like, actually, I, I steal this from you, is you cannot do more than two or three dribbles in the same direction. You have to either attacking or one dribble, you're cut off, you need to go in the other direction. I think that I don't love on-air stuff, even with the pros, but even if it, if it seems counterintuitive, for young players, I never do it. For the pros, sometimes I do it to have them a new tool, and the reason why I think it's more effective than we young, with young players is that if I told one of my players, okay, now they ice on the pick and roll, you're going to try to do this, for example, like a diagonal dribble backward, and either I'm going to be the guided defense, you can make a spin and try to attack the middle, or now after the dribble, you're going to attack the pick and roll toward the, the baseline, the sideline. They have in their mind the experience and the ability to imagine it at least a decent level to know they know where to put the ball. They know what to do, more or less. Obviously, we're going to put the defense in very, very early. But if I do the same, the same thing with like a 16-year-old player that has just learned how to play the pick and roll, it's going to be completely messy. They don't know exactly where they're going to have to put the ball. They don't know exactly what it means that it's going to be an ice, aggressive ice, more deep ice. So it's useless. So I know it seems strange, but I prefer to have on-air practices with older and better player. And, and that makes sense because somewhat too, we're talking about workload management and some of these things that we're not talking about as much with youth players as well, because they need more reps to be able to develop the skills that we're talking about. Coach, another valuable thing about one-on-one -on -one is there's less perceptual demands. So you can focus on individual skills and decisions and developing those. So talk to us about giving feedback while a player is practicing one-on-one. -on -one. So I think that when we give feedback too many times, we try to catch five rabbits at the same time. And it's so normal for me. I, I am so guilty of this so many times, even right now. But um, let's say that we are focusing on the pre-catch decision. So you have space to attack in front of you, maybe to make a back cut, maybe to shoot immediately. And then when we say this to the player, and as soon as the one on one start, he maybe try to attack in one direction. And during the counter move to the cutoff, he lose the ball. He may commit a turnover. And we're like, oh, yeah, on the crossover, you should have, I don't know, the ball was too far away from your body. You need to uh, make a behind the back over there, another crossover in front. And we're actually not sticking to what our goal was. So our, the player is going to try to, as you, you mentioned, workload manager is going to try to think, okay, so the thing that I do before the catch is important, but it's also very important what I do after a catch. Well, it's hard, but we need to stick what our goal is. And even if the player is going to maybe miss a layer, miss like a, a decision on the second layer, we need to stick to what our primary goal is. And this doesn't mean, I want to be super clear on this for coaches, that you should ignore everything else. If we are making a small set of games, the player make the pre-catch decision right every time, but miss the layup six times in a row, maybe I can say, okay, maybe there's something wrong. Maybe the secondary defender that I had over there is too much for him because I want him to be successful. I want him to have the gratification of making a basket. So maybe I will, you know, make maybe the secondary defender is going to come in a little bit later, a little bit more passive, but I cannot go to him and tell him five different things. Maybe we say, okay, now the pre-catch is, is great. Now let's focus on the layup. You missed the last five. Okay, now your goal is that. Um, and this is even worse when we coach young players and we move on from one-on-one -on -one to three-on-three -three situation. And we say to our players, you know, guys, we've practiced one-on-one -on -one all day. Now this is the time where you put your skills to use in a three-on-three -three situation. Okay, great, let's go. And the first connect, the first three feedbacks are, okay, but now the spacing is not great. And now you should have cut over there. You should have, um, I don't know, you should have uh, space in a different way. And while these are great feedback, great correction, we are actually losing the point. Like our players would immediately think at everything else, but not the one-on-one. -on -one. So what I do, and I've actually learned this from a coach's guide to teaching the Doug Lemos book, uh, is I have my phone with me 
and I use it only as like an audio recorder. Uh, it's better than taking notes because I'm so so young. I pretend to be young. I'm not so young anymore. <laughs> but um, it worked better for me to have like a small audio note for myself to say, okay, the spacing is not great. We need to be able, I don't know, to shift better when the ball is coming to us. Or maybe the spacing in front of the ball is great, but we are not adjusting our position from the weak side. Like everything, but especially if we're just started and if the one-on-one decision on the catch, on the counter move are great. I don't want to have them focus on something else. And this leads back to the first thing that we said that with the youth is not as much about playing great basketball. And it's our, we need to put our egos aside and know that sometimes we are doing the best thing for our players. Again, I'm not saying play randomly. I'm not saying do not care about spacing of the ball. There's a time where you should focus on that and not coaching the one-on-one catch, the one-on-one decision on the catch. But we need to be intentional in what we do. Maybe for you, this today, the spacing is the most important thing. You're going to correct that 50 times, but you should do it only if that was your intention when you're coming to practice. You know, am I clear enough? I love it. Yeah, no, I, I love it. It's it's so, such an important concept to be able to share. And then the, the other part that goes with all of this, and that's what you see on the video, is that all of these one-on-ones connect back to the game and they connect back as a dynamic start to say a small sided game or to a five on five, where you don't have to stay in one-on-one for these situations. You can take them into small sided games and five on five. Can't you? Yeah, exactly. And once again, like I was trying and you in the videos there are, there is my mic. So you can hear me saying, I was trying to be as good as possible keeping every connection to the one-on-one. So we have some great run three. The guys have never played together before. They were just together for four days at the camp. And they were playing three on three in a great way for me. We never play five on five, I have to be honest. But on the three on three, they were making decisions on the fly every time, making quick decisions, quick passes. And we insisted a lot. And this is something that for me is crucial in all of my youth teaching that the first read that the player should have is that on the catch, they are neutral or they have an advantage. If they have an advantage, they should try to maintain it and by attacking, by making an extra pass. Well, if they're neutral, this is when the fun can start in a way, meaning that this is where you as a coach, you can think what you want. Maybe at a lower level, you can say, okay, I want my player to be able to develop the ability to play one-on-one out of a neutral situation. So maybe with a skate dribble to try to generate a reaction, the use of the skate dribble for me is to try to turn a static situation into a dynamic one, try to generate a reaction. Or if you have maybe older kids, you can say, okay, if you're neutral, you play a get action. You go for an end off with a closer teammate to you. You are gonna try to pass and screen for, and screen away somebody else. So once that distinction is clear, you can build it on it. So every time you catch with an advantage, you do this. Every time you're neutral, this is what you can do in our system. And it can be the same for everybody. Maybe at the older age, it can be different compared to the role, compared to the skills and the constraints of the individual player. Well, neutral is such an important concept. And uh, basically, again, means you have no advantage. But that is a key trigger for when we're talking about going from advantage-based offense into trying to create an advantage out of some type of conceptual or set-based offense. So uh, a great segue. So uh, I I know this uh, from what we've talked about before, and you've said this, is that uh, in Europe the best basketball teams now have a blend of structure and unstructure and being the unstructure being conceptual. So can you talk about that in terms of European basketball and how some of the best teams blend that? Yeah. I, so I'm in love with some top European basketball, like uh, Tenerife, Manresa and Virtus Bologna are the one that I love to watch the most. I hope I didn't forget any of the great coaches that there are in Europe, but there are so many more, but the idea is that the, European basketball is still not as conceptual as the NBA, for example, but you start to see some concept, even concept play in a set-based offense. What I mean is that we have very complex, but uh, some more complex, some less, uh, set, some flow action. But after that, what happened after the play, then is where the fun starts, the coverage solution. So... You can see, even if the set is different, maybe you can try to have a particular set that try to prevent the defense from being able to edge. But if they edge, if they're aggressive on the ball, 
then this is what we're going to do. Like play a short roll and I don't know, corner cut, wing shift in the corner, and we play from there. And I will make an example because I find it so fascinating, fascinating to watch. If you watch, for example, Virtus Bologna play, they are great in this. Every time somebody comes off a screen, he has basically two options. If he doesn't, if he's not open to shoot or to drive, if it's not an advantage situation, as we said, if he's neutral, he can either pass it to the original screener and go into a guard to guard split with a passer of the initial screen situation, or he can drive toward his passer and teammate. And then the initial screener, I hope this is clear, but it's, it's going to be so, compli- so complex just by voice. But the initial screener basically is going to come back and scream for him again. So even if you did not understand completely what I said, the idea is that after every off-screen situation, this can be a down screen, a pin down, a stagger, a floppy situation, you can enter into these options every time with the initial passer and the initial screener playing this three-man game. So uh, I, I, I just want to, the most surprising thing that you said there, I think for a lot of coaches and a lot of American coaches listening to this podcast is that you are saying the NBA is ahead in conceptual offense. And probably going back 10, 15 years, I would say everyone in America was fascinated by European basketball. But it speaks to how the NBA has just evolved and changed and grown, hasn't it? Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the NBA basketball. I think uh, the differences in rules and in the structure of the season itself should not be undervalued. For sure, there's a lot of difference. I'm not saying that like European teams are doing something wrong, but I think that for the amount of resources that the NBA team invested into analytics, into player development, into uh, trying to find the edge. I think right now they are maybe not more advanced, but they are taking a different path than Europe. Uh, I think the NBA games look so much more different than it did uh, 20 years ago. And not just in the type of shots that players are taking, but in how they get there. While the European basketball is still different than 20 years ago, very much different, but we still get to different shot in not the same way, but in a way that is more similar compared to what the NBA is doing. And one of the main reasons why I think analytics didn't catch up so much in Europe, so there are two main reasons. First of all, the NBA has so many great uh, tools with you know the cameras and the ability to evaluate the shot quality of any given shot of the expected physical value like you can really be more objective when you speak about this in Europe you can't you simply can you have, you can have the feeling okay today we take so many good shots we miss so many of them but it, you're never gonna have some proof at least I don't know if your league team honestly have that kind of uh, structure at their disposal but I don't I actually don't think so. And the other thing is that when you listen to like the great NBA podcast in December, January, they're still saying, oh, it's still only 15, 20 games into the season. It's very hard. It's very early to take anything out of this number. For us, if you don't play maybe the cup, if you don't play EuroLeague, if you're only watching a single league, 15, 20 games is the whole season. Like, and uh, it's very hard. Maybe some player missed some games, like your sample size is so much smaller than I, f- I understand why it's harder for people to find out definitive data to change your basketball view due to that data. Well, and, in, and the other part that we've talked about on this podcast is just, again, there's a, there, there does tend to be a little bit more creativity and diversity of style in Europe because you're dealing with imperfect rosters, imperfect resources, and also, you know, you're getting fired in the first month if you're not, you're not doing something good in Europe, aren't you? So coaches tend to try things a little bit more, don't they? Yeah, I think uh, the amount of pressure that there is to winning in the regular season, it's really hard to explain that somebody that's never lived a European season. Like you hear when uh, like a former European professional player, like NBA uh, American professional player that has played in Europe, how we play about, how we speak about this environment. Not just the, the environment in terms of like the fans are crazy and we all see the images of Kevin Durant in, in Pireo watching the fan go crazy, but it's uh, how much pressure you have to win. If you start a season 0-3, it's, it's tough. It can be really tough for your job security, especially if it's the first season over there. And the second part is that the turnovers player is so quick you cannot have the same player for two more years. Maybe you're going to end up having him for three years, 
but you almost never you know when you sign him. So this is one of the things that I don't love a lot about European basketball. And I love watching Euroleague. Like I want to be clear, I love watching Euroleague basketball and like high level European competition is that you can see, for example, the development that Jalen Brown took with the Celtics. And or you can see even younger player like Jordan Poole right now with the Warriors. Like they have a path for him. They had a path from the first season and maybe at some bumpy times, but you know, it's a clear path that you see. In Europe, it's harder. Like, and I'm not blaming it, I want to be clear, on coaches, on organization. It's simply the structure. Like it's the the competitive environment, the the way the leagues are played, the, the way the financial system is about. It's, it's not easy to create something, to create like a five-year plan for a player. Well, and in fact, that's rare that a player is even with a team for five years, isn't it? Unless they yeah. came up through yeah. the youth program or something like that. So I would phrase it like this. I, I think it makes sense. One of the main reasons why it's hard to play fully conceptual and why I think it's tricky for coaches to find the right way between a set-based offense and a conceptual offense is that you need to be able to have a common ground between being aggressive in the first action and run your set. Because a lot of the best set in Europe are based on the idea that, okay, now you come up the first pin down, maybe you end off the ball with a point guard or what, and now you're going to take the flare. And what if a player come off the first pin down with a slight advantage? So everybody knows that if he come off completely open, he's going to shoot it, he's going to try to drive it. If his player is dead, he's falling down. But it's the gray area over there. So what do you do if you have a little advantage? You want to explore it, like trying to drive inside, even if it maybe it's going to maybe harder to go into the next option of your set. And I think for coaches with so many things, it's not about what you actually coach. Every coach is going to say to, your, to their player, oh, yes, for sure you're free to attack if you're open. But it's what happened when he do it. And it turns out maybe not a turnover, but he lose the advantage. Like, how much freedom you give on the first option of something and one do you want to say, okay, maybe you're open, but you know, run this. Like we want to make them run because this is something that different players inside the same team can have a different sensibilities about it. We, we play a lot of conceptual offense in transition. We play a sort of like European flow, but with a lot of freedom, the two guys on the same side can either scream for each other. Uh, they can do a lot of different stuff. Uh, and sometimes our player come to us and say, yeah, but, you know, like uh, I was open on the switch and they didn't give me the ball. And he's right. It's not wrong. It's simply that the more freedom you gave, the less control you're going to have. And I understand why that can be frustrating sometimes. I think there's no right or wrong. Like you need to find the right balance. And it's, it's really tricky. And it's one of the things that I love the most about coaching, the, the fine line between freedom and adding control. Not just control for you as a coach to be a control freak, but to say, okay, Chris has an advantage in the post. We need to get to him. Mm -hmm. Well, and also for players. I mean, not all players play really well with just complete freedom. So a lot of them, the structure helps them as well. And, uh, you know, Doug Novak, uh, who uh, is now an assistant at Army, we've talked about that extensively, that the value of the structure can help players. And uh, it's a gradual process even to give them freedom for some of them because they're not used to it either, are they? Exactly. Uh, it's, it's crazy because uh, players are, are not used to freedom and every player, not every player, but some player would love to have freedom for themselves. But when their teammate has freedom and basically they do a mistake, it's like, oh, yeah, but you should have passed the ball to me. You should have, or not even that like selfishly, but like, I think you should have gone on and, and played the second side while he tried to drive and maybe it wasn't successful. Like, I think the way we deal with mistakes is crucial for coaches, but it's also crucial for coaches to create a safe culture of error with your own team. And that is never easy. But the way we address mistakes on the court, in the video room, in our practices, are really shaping the group. I think the coach has more power than it think in the way his team behave. I, I'm not gonna say that like every time there's a bad culture, it depends on the coach, you have professional players, they're like 30-year-old players, they have their own personality, but a coach is a great conductor of that. It can be a great role model of positive behavior compared to uh, facing mistakes or bad behavior facing mistakes. 
Love that. Love that whole discussion. And uh, to, to just bring it back to some of the European concepts uh, that you've shared with me. I want Look, I want to get into some of the unique things. Uh, you've shared some really unique things. And uh, one of them that you shared this year is this nexting concept where you next the ball screen, but you shared this concept of nexting on off the ball screen situations. Can you just briefly yeah. describe that and share that? Because I think that was one of the coolest things that you shared with me this year. Yeah, uh, I've seen it the first time against JC Carroll a few years ago with Real Madrid and Barcelona was doing that. So basically, um, let's, let's imagine that you are defending a floppy situation or like a pin down situation and you're the defending of the passer. Maybe you're not too close to the ball, but you are actually like playing as a goalkeeper, trying to make the pass a little bit slower. And when the ball starts flying, again, the timing is crucial. You run together with the ball and you try to arrive with the ball, even if we all know that the ball is quicker than you, you try to arrive with the ball to the player and you try to be in front of him. And the position of your body, the body angle is crucial because you want to make it the pass back to the passer harder and slower. Because if the offense is able to do pass to the off screener player, pass back to the passer, now the passer is completely open. And basically it's like a jump switch with two players. So I'm coming out the screen, I'm guarding him. I try to push him out as high as possible. And as soon as the ball is flying, I'm, I'm playing over his shoulder and going to, to, the, to the passer. You can do this as a two-man switch. You can also think about the rotation. So maybe now the, there's a third man rotating to the passer. And now the, screener, the off-screen player defender is coming to the weak side completely. We have done some of that in the season. And we think it's one of those tactic that cannot be your main off-screen solution, but it can really, you know, mess with the timing and with the set of a team for a short period of time. So I think that Europe is fascinating and the playoff even more for, the, for this reason is that basketball is so tactic. And as you said, the roster are so imperfect and you don't find like NBA players that are able to do anything against you. But you're able to see some stat some tactics that maybe work only for 15 minutes, but are the right 15 minutes to win the game. So if you watch Bayern Monaco with Trinquieri against Barcelona, they were doing something like very extreme. They were switching everything, every off-screen situation, even with Mirotic, which is one of the best post-up players in Europe. And they were trying to switch it to front it. And Barcelona, which one of the best roster in Europe, with one of the best coaches in Europe, they were still having a tough time solving it sometimes. And they were you know, alternating solutions. Sometimes they will switch everything. Sometimes they won't. So the offense doesn't know what to expect exactly. And I think if I love, and Nick Nurse spoke about that, like in Europe, you need to be creative. You need to find different ways. Okay, a box and one right now, like a, a zone that becomes a man after two passes, something like that. Well, and all that connects back to the importance of being able to play conceptual basketball and, you know, the one-on-one -on -one situations and advantage-based basketball that you talk about. Because again, you, you, very rarely in Europe can you just run your set perfectly against a team, right? Yeah. <laughs> I want you to talk about this one, the nail help and the stunt. And you're just seeing some differences and variability within that. Yeah. So uh, five years ago, I think somebody told me, oh, because I was being an assistant with a team, with a professional team that was like icing everything, icing everything on the side. And somebody came to me and said, Yo, you know, like Obradovich, one of the greatest coaches in Europe, his defense sent everything to the middle. And I was like, what? Like he sent everything to the middle? Like it doesn't make sense. Like why you do that? And I started watching and I started to understand, obviously like he had a complex defense for EuroLeague, so I'm oversimplifying now, but they were sent everything to the closest man, everything. And they were relying a lot on like stunt, and recover instead of going into rotation from the weak side. And I, I was fascinated by, the, by this idea. I started speaking about it with other coaches. And some American coaches told me, I like it. I don't think it can work in the NBA because the space is so big. And because the level of players or shooters that is so big, is so good, that you cannot do that in the NBA. And, you know, this year, it caught my eyes watching the playoff. Like, Boston is doing a lot of that. And it's one of the best differences in the NBA. They don't do it as much on pick and roll situation, as much as like ISO with the, third, with the first pass guy helping a lot. But it's very, very similar in the end result, maybe not the situation that generates it. And I think that since, since this has been common in Europe for many years, teams in Europe have started to come up with ideas to punish it. You see teams 
let's say that it's a pick and roll going to the side of two player, like a top pick and roll going to the side of two, and there's a lot of stunt, nail help. The most common situation that you see is either like a 45 cut with the corner lifting a little bit to create a passing window, or the corner cut with the wing shifting to the corner, you know, to take away the stunt. And now in the NBA, that's a little bit harder to see, even though I have to say that uh, the Bucks in round two are doing a good job of mixing in when Yanis is playing one-on-one, -on -one, somebody that is a cut from the wing, somebody that is a cut from the, the corner, they are trying to mix in some cut and some more unpredictable spacing. And I want to add something to this because I think it's fascinating. Uh, imagine that you're playing a pick and roll toward the side of two, so there's a stunt. So when, when should that player cut? One of my players asked me that when we were playing against a team that was standing a lot. And I, and I like buffer for a while, They're like when you, sh you should cut? Because I think that it depends what your goal is. If you want to prevent the help, you should start earlier. You should start before the ball is starting. You want to take away the help and maybe you generate space for the pull-up jumper at the elbow or some other options. While if you want to punish the help, you have completely different timing. You have to start when your defender is already helping. And your philosophy on this as a coach can change. And it can change based on your players. It can change based on the game that you're playing, on your opponent. Like it really, really nuance discussion. It is a fascinating discussion and it, it leads us into another topic, which I know you're passionate about. And we're going to get you to run a, we're going to get you to write a blog on this because I love, I love your thinking and your thought process on game prep and particularly something around the tough decisions a coach has to make. And this is something that I always wrestled with too. And that's this, this kind of balance you have to find between doing something that you already do perfectly or you've worked on all year as a team versus coming up or, or using a tactic that might be the best solution against this specific opponent that you haven't worked on as much. And, and that, that's a real dilemma for a coach, isn't it? Yeah. And I think there's never a right answer. Like when you win, you say, oh, this time I nailed it. And maybe you win, but not because of that decision. For sure you didn't win. Game preparation is something that I think is undervalued, especially in Europe. I don't know how many American teams do it. Is that a lot of teams in Europe watch the last four games of the opponent, five games, three games, whatever, but they're watching like only in a chronological order. While I think that what I do usually as an assistant, but obviously agreed upon with my head coach, is that I watch the last three games, but also I go on and watch the games with opponents that are similar than us. So for example, if I have a stretch five, if I have a pick and pop player, maybe they never played against a pick and pop player in the last three games, I need to see what they did against that. If I have a, maybe a tall guard, like a Ben Simmons type that is not a great shooter, I need to see what they did against that type of player. Because otherwise I'm going into the game blindly. If we run a lot of floppy situation, eyes in the post for our guards, what do they do? They try to front it, they try to help with the fives, they try to trap. So this is something that I think is crucial. And I want to suggest to for every coaches right now with synergy with instant, it's so much easier, luckily, to find access to any sort of game. So something that we try to do as a coaching staff and that I really like as a thought process for myself as an assistant is I watch a team. Let's say that I watch your team playing. I want to come up with the best ideal game plan against your player. So for example, your lefty point guard, I should send it to the right and maybe try to be edge aggressively because he's not a great passer in those situations. Against that other player, it's better to deep drop because... I don't know, or we go under and under with that player because it's not a shooter. And so I came up with three different solutions and maybe other three different solutions for the different screeners that you can have. And okay, three different situations. Okay, you came off screen different ways. Or oh, in this set, we can help with the passer. In this set, we can switch. I don't know. Obviously, this is completely unrealistic. And maybe it can make sense, like in a playoff series, you can decide a little bit more, but not in a normal game. So what we go from there is say, okay, we have to window it down a little bit. So what is the most common spacing that they play on pick and roll? For example, they are a top pick and roll team. They are a, a side pick and roll team. They play the side pick and roll with the empty corner or with the full corner the most. So we try to pick an option that it can be the best one for what we are able to do and for what your team does. And when do we do two different coverages? Two different coverages based on the ball handler, based on the screener, based on the screen location. I think you need to have a feeling of how good your team is, but like how 
they can handle different coverages. And it's not easy. And I think this is something we can we coach can increase during the season. This is something that a great Italian coach said in a clinic that I've heard, and that when you introduce something to your team, let's say in November, in October, the way you present it should never be, oh, we play Chris team, so we're going to switch everything. It should always be, we play Chris team, we take this as an option, as an opportunity to switch everything today, but this is going to come helpful for us in June, in May, in the playoff. This is going to come helpful for us in March for another game. And you also practice your team ability to do different stuff. So this team, this season, we've been lucky enough to have many blowout wins or like we, games that we were able to win with confidence at home, especially. And we use those games sometimes to experiment with new stuff, offense, defense, um, because in the end, in June, how much you're adaptable is going gonna, is gonna to matter. How much you're able to shift quickly. Okay, now we show everything. Now we, we ice everything. Now we go under and, and blitz. We switch, under and switch, whatever. Like, you need to have a team who's able to adapt different coverages. And this is not something that comes easy. When you introduce a concept, uh, the way you introduce it to your player should not only be like, okay, five on five work through or five on zero work through. I feel this idea from Trinkeria, Trinkeria Clinic, for example. Let's say we have only three days to prepare a game and your main ball handler is a right-handed player. Great when he goes to the right, terrible when he goes to the left. So the first day that I'm going to, the first drill, warm-up drill that I'm going to do, the first day that I'm preparing that game is, okay, pair of player running up and down with two assistants at the wing. On one side, they're going to jog up and ice to send him to his left. On the other side, they're going to try to, send him to the middle to his left hand again and never to his right. So this is only is also useful not just for you know the tactics of it. They will remember it, you brought in the game plan, but it also shows to the player a clear priority. Okay, this is a priority for us. This is something that we're gonna see the first moment, we're gonna practice it one two in a live situation, we're gonna practice it five on five later. But I I read this in the Culture Code, a great book by Coyle, that oftentimes the leader think that the employers, the employees have the priority clear, while a survey has revealed that like 3% of the employees knew exactly what the top priority were, where the manager said that it was going to be clear to everybody in like the 87, 86%, something like that. So you need to communicate the priorities for your game plan. Another use of the small sided games that we have in practice is to simulate through some task constraint to some point system manipulation something of the opponents that we don't have so for example let's say that the opponents have a great pick and pop five like a really threatening player from the outside and we don't have that in our roster what we have done many times this season is okay we want for example to make a late switch or we think he is good but we can make our high flat to recover but if our Five is going to shoot open and it's going to score. It's going to be five points instead of three. So we understand because what's happening in practice is that we want to have competitive practices. We want to have player caring about the scrimmage. So if they know that their opponent five is not going to be a shooter, they're going to let him shoot. But well, if you say, okay, now if he scores, it's going to be five points. Yeah, I want to win this game. They're going to have to close out and to play competitively. And it can be the same. You can have like a player with a great pull-up two-point shooter at the elbow Maybe our game plan is predicated on taking that away. If we take a pull-up jumper at the elbow, it's three points, like if it was a pull-up jumper from three. So these are something that is also, again, a reinforcer for the players to understand what your priority are as a coach, because that is crucial. They have to understand from everything that you do what your priorities are for that particular game. And it all makes sense. And, uh, you know, Easier said than done, of course. And then the other part it brings us to is that evaluation post game and trying to remove our bias from the score. And I know you have some thoughts on that as well and focusing on more of a process based uh, uh, review of the game. Yeah. So this is crucial during the game and after the game. And I think we need to have clear in our mind if it's a, it's a pick your poison game, basketball. So did you actually took the shot that we wanted you to take 
and you were able to score it. Or we tried to execute our game plan and we were not able to execute it. Because if you, these are completely different situations and these require our adjustment and our addressing this with a team to be completely different. If we create a game plan that was predicated on you taking open trees with your, with your big man because we didn't believe they were good shooters and they score in that game 50, 56% against us, maybe it was a bad decision or maybe simply was a good decision, but the, the variable that day was wrong. Like we had a bad luck and it can happen. We could have maybe changed it on the fly or maybe we should have stick with it until the end. Or our gameplay was predicated in taking away the paint and your guard was scoring 25 points in the paint. So it's a completely different situation. Or maybe we won the game and so we are go all happy, we take a beer and we say, oh, the gameplay was great. And then we go on and see that your best shooter took 10 threes uncontested and he scored one of 10 and we won the game and we, we believe that we played a good game, but we didn't. And I think for coaching staff, being able to evaluate what's going on, especially in close games, think about how much how our mood changes if we won by one or if we lose by one. And in the end, it's exactly the same game. And obviously, basketball has a high emotional game. I am the first one to advocate that the night of game, if you have time, if you're not in a playoff situation, you can relax. Like you, you won, you lose, you go home, you relax, you can stay with your kids, you can uh, hang out with your friends, with your girlfriend, whatever. But we need to try to be as objective as possible if we want to improve, as science-based, process-based as possible. Absolutely. You need to do that for sure. Um, Coach, I mean, one of the curious questions I have for you, uh, and you can talk about this, you referenced Ross McVeigh's, uh, you know, him coaching at Louisville last year, uh, talking to someone about like yourself, who's got tons of professional experience and tons of uh, creative ideas and studied the game. I'm curious, uh, what is your perspective on what value you could bring to say an NCAA division one program as someone who's coached in Europe, let's, let's remove recruiting. Obviously that's the key to all NCAA basketball, but <laughs> beyond recruiting, what's something like you could bring to a, a division one program. So I think that having a pair of eyes that sees the game in a different lenses is crucial. Like, and I will also reverse what you're saying. Like I would love, to have an assistant coach over here who is coming up from the high school basketball system, from the NCAA basketball system. I have actually a friend of mine who has watched uh, a couple of our games. He's a college assistant and he's been giving me like great feedback. Like, yeah, you should focus on that. And why you like, it's a different pair of eyes. I think like Europe has still, especially compared to college game, some edges in the way we can run some set. There's a lot of margin to growth over there and both in terms of player development, in terms of like being able to teach, to read on fly, to read while the ball is flying to you, but also in terms of like the strategic decision that we can play, the way we scout every game, as we said, game preparation. I think it's not because the European system is better, but because you have somebody that comes into your locker room with a completely different opinion. And maybe it's not gonna be wrong is not going to be right every time for sure. In the beginning, it's going to try to adjust. Okay, I need to understand which kind of sports am I watching? What is the referee blowing? What, what's going on? But I think in the end, after just a few months, like the ability is going to be huge and it's going to be also like a great connection for the players of that program to be able to come in Europe to play overseas basketball because in the end, we know how many, how few players come from college to play in the NBA while so many more can play in a European basketball if they want to, if they choose to. Well, I love that. Yeah. Pers- I love that perspective. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely true to be able to learn from everyone. And that's really what, uh, you know, COVID and the, the zoom every day that we could learn from someone and uh, interact and share has just been tremendous. And can't thank, thank you. you enough <laughs> uh, for sharing the game with us. And I can't encourage coaches enough to go check out Francesco nanny basketball.com at immersionvideos.com and uh, check out the uh, developing one-on-one skills with Francesco nanny, just tremendous stuff, coach. Thanks for sharing the game with us. Uh, Thank you, Chris. It's been a pleasure.